Hello everyone. Uh, Maxime Favier, the PhD student on the Mercury Optical Lattice Clock at CERT. And uh, as Roger said, I'm going to present you the comparison of our Mercury frequency standard with uh, primary cesium representation of the second and the secondary frequency standards. Uh, so the outline of my talk will be the following. I will first present you the Mercury Optical Lattice Clock uh, setup. Uh, then we'll go through the characterization of the systematics affecting the clock frequency. Uh, and we'll finally go to the frequency ratio uh, measurements, both in the microwave to optical domain versus uh, cesium and rubidium, and the uh, direct optical to optical comparison versus the strontium clock uh, at CERT. So, uh, first of all, why is Mercury a good candidate to build uh, an optical clock? Um, it has a spin one half uh, on the ground state, which makes the uh, transition uh, insensitive to tensor light shift. Um, as well, uh, a very crucial point for the, the Mercury optical standard is uh, its very weak sensitivity to, to DBR shift that are affecting uh, the strontium clocks and the ytterbium clocks. Uh, also, mercury is liquid at room temperature, which means that it has a very high vapor pressure. Uh, so we won't need an oven to obtain a decent uh, background pressure of mercury. Um, and finally, the clock transition is rather sensitive to time variations of the time structure constant. Uh, but all these perks come uh, at the price of uh, uh, UV laser sources that you have to deal with. Uh, both for the cooling transition and for the clock transition in the DPV, as well as for the, the magic trapping frequency. Uh, so there are going to lie the, the challenges for our uh, optical standard. Uh, so the experimental setup is rather simple. We have a reservoir of uh, mercury, uh, which creates a pressure, a uh, vapor pressure, which is loaded straight into a 3D magnet optical trap. Uh, the light for the magneto-optical trap comes from uh, an external cavity diode laser amplified and then uh, doubled twice in frequency to go to 254 nanometers. Um, then we trap the atoms in the optical lattice. Um, we have a titanium sapphire laser which is locked to a, a wave meter with 10 megahertz uncertainty uh, to measure the, the magic frequency. And we double uh, this light uh, to get to the, to the magic wavelengths. We trap the atom in a vertical uh, build-up cavity. Uh, and we then are, have our uh, clock laser set up. So it's a fiber laser, which is locked to a 10 centimeter uh, ULA cavity uh, with a flicker floor of 4 10 to minus 16. Um, this is split. Uh, in two, one part goes to the fiber com to be counted, uh, and another part goes to the mercury table. It is doubled twice to go to the clock frequency, uh, the clock wavelength of 266 nanometers, and we probe the atom uh, vertically in the lattice and detect the, the fluorescence from the ground state. Um, the clock sequence is uh, I would say rather simple. We load the atoms into the magnet optical trap. And then one nice feature that we've recently implemented is a simple state selection or spin polarization. So what we do is um, we excite selectively uh, one of the two Zeeman components of, from the, the ground state uh, with the pi pulse of the clock light. And then uh, we blow away the remaining population in the second uh, Zeeman sublevel uh, with a shot of cooling light. And we're left with a spin per eye sample uh, with only 50% atom loss with a process which could be, in principle, very fast. Uh, for it, it's limited to 20 milliseconds uh, because of the rather low available UV power that we have uh, on, the, on the clock light. Um, and then we probe the atoms uh, in, in the lattice with a 100 millisecond uh, rabbit time. And this clock cycle takes around 0.9 seconds, which we have optimized for the short-term stability of the clock. Um, 
when we perform spectroscopy uh, of the atomic uh, transition of the clock, um, we can go up to 260 millisecond um, rabbit time, which gives us uh, 3 hertz line width and the quality factor of uh, 310 to the 14. Um, when we lock our clock laser to, to this uh, atomic transition, we get a short term stability around 1 10 to minus 15 uh, at one second, going down a square root of tau. So we are not yet at the big limit. Uh, and then, as you can see on the blue, the blue points here, we crash on the flicker floor of our ultra stable cavity at 4 10 to minus 16. Uh, and then, what we want to do is perform the differential measurement. Um, to characterize the systematics of the clock. Um, and in a differential mode, we get the, the red curve here, which uh, boils down to a resolution of 10 to minus uh, 16 uh, within uh, 1,000 seconds of uh, integration. So using this, uh, this stability, we'll, uh, we'll uh, look at the systematics affecting the, the clock frequency. Uh, the first one that we looked at was the collisional shift to make sure that it doesn't affect uh, the measurement of other systematics. So how, how do we do that? Basically, um, we lock uh, on, the, on the atomic transition uh, with a high atomic density configuration uh, for 10 clock cycles. And then for the next 10 clock cycles, we lock with a low uh, atomic density configuration and we look at the frequency difference between these two configurations. Uh, and what we've observed is a, a shift consistent with zero um, at the mid uh, 10 to minus 17 level, um, at least at the operating point of our clock. Uh, then we went on to measure the lattice light shift, which is the biggest concern for us. Uh, well, thanks to nice um, improvement on the, on the setup, we were able to get uh, uh, trap depth of up to around 60 recoils. Uh, just uh, to give you an idea, it corresponds to 5.5 uh, watts of circulating power in the build-up cavity at uh, 362 nanometers. And we performed differential measurements uh, from 56 recoils down to uh, 25 recoils for different detunings from the, the magic wavelengths. Uh, I should say that with this kind of lever arm, in principle, we don't expect to resolve uh, nonlinear lattice shifts. Uh, so we perform a, a global linear fit of this data, and we, we extract uh, the linear uh, coefficient of the lattice light shift as well as the magic frequency, and we get a, a value which is in very good agreement with the value found in the Katowice group at weekend. Um, and then. What we do is we want to verify that we indeed uh, uh, don't resolve the nonlinear light shift. So we've performed a nonlinear fit on this data and check that it's consistent with our linear fit within the, the uncertainty. And as well, we calculate the nonlinear lattice shift uh, based on a theoretical uh, model. Uh, and we correct for this uh, shift uh, in, in fast processing. Uh, and so this shift is the main limitation to, to the clock uh, uncertainty, uh, mainly due to the, the wave meter which is used to, to lock the lattice light. Um, and for the other systematics, we've looked at the second order Zeeman effect. So what we do is we run uh, four integrators in parallel in a differential mode. And from these four integrators, we track the splitting between the two Zeeman transition, which is uh, directly in situ measurement of the magnetic field at the position of the atoms and the center frequency of the clock. And from this data, we extract the, the second order Zeeman coefficient. Uh, we've also checked for uh, um, phase uh, transients in the AOM, which is used to provide the clock pulses. Um, and finally, the last point on the uncertainty budget is the BBR uh, shift which for us is not that much of a concern. So as you can see, um, with uh, 1.5 Kelvin uncertainty on the temperature of the, the, at the point of the atom and the 10% uncertainty on the calculated coefficient, we can manage this shift um, here uh, at 
the 1 beta minus 16 level with the 10 to minus 17 level uncertainty. Um, and I should say that some systematics in this uncertainty budget are limited only by statistics. So we could improve upon them just by taking more data. Um, so now that we've characterized our, uh, our clock, uh, and we're at the, at the limit, basically, of what the SI system of units can do, um, we want to compare it with uh, micro standards as well as uh, optical standards that we have at CERT. Um, so the heart of the, of the comparison is uh, the fiber comb. Uh, this comb is locked uh, to an ultra-stable cavity in the optical domain, and it counts the, the frequency of the mercury laser, which is locked to the atoms, and of the strontium laser, which is locked to the, the strontium atoms, um, which allows us to perform a direct optical-to-optical -optical, uh, frequency ratio measurement. Uh, and then the microwave of the comb is uh, used to, to perform a comparison with the uh, atomic fountain clocks that we have at CERT, uh, which are uh, part of uh, a microwave ensemble comprising a, a cryogenic sapphire oscillator. Uh, and this yields uh, a stability in the microwave domain, which is really quite, quite good. Uh, so when we look at the comparison of our mercury clock with the microwave standards, so the, the microwave standard at CERT is a dual species uh, rubidium and cesium fountain. Um, we get this stability curve, uh, which are limited uh, by the stability of the microwave standards. Uh, so around 5 10 to minus 14 at one second. Uh, and we average down to the 10 to minus 16 level uh, in around 10 to the 5 seconds. Um, so these uh, data allowed us to perform a direct uh, absolute frequency measurement of the mercury uh, clock transition with a fractional uncertainty of 3 10 to minus 16, uh, as well as the first measurement of the mercury to rubidium frequency ratio, also with an uncertainty uh, in the low 10 to minus 16 range. Um, and then we looked at the measurement against the strontium optical lattice clock. Uh, as you can see, the stability is much better uh, thanks to the, the optical frequency domain. Um, we get stabilities uh, around uh, in the low 10 to minus 15 at one second. So basically, we reach the uncertainty of the mercury clock uh, in around 1,000 seconds. Um, and we measured the, the frequency ratio of the mercury to strontium clock transitions uh, with a fractional uncertainty of 2 pet to minus 16. Um, so a few comments uh, on these results. We performed the frequency ratios of mercury against uh, three secondary representations of the second, uh, which are interesting results for fundamental physics tests of the variation of constant, for example, as well as uh, in view of the redefinition of the SI second to add uh, the mercury clock as a secondary representation of the second, which is not at the moment. Um, we also performed uh, a di direct absolute frequency measurement of the mercury clock transition uh, which, uh, with a, um, an uncertainty a factor of 30 better than the previous a direct measurement which was done by our group in 2012 uh, and which is at the limit of the realization of the SI second. And finally, we've measured the mercury to strontium uh, frequency ratio uh, for the second time after the, the frequency ratio that was measured uh, in Professor Kateri's group at Riken. Um, I would like to point out that these two measurements are uh, completely separate. They are have been done in two completely independent labs, um, and uh, the reproducibility at the 10 to minus 16 level is quite good. Um, so now, just a few prospects for the, the future of the mercury clock. Uh, we, we, we would really like to improve on the short-term stability of our clock, and for that we have a few ideas, the first of which is to activate uh, 2D mod to make use of the high vapor pressure of mercury that we have. Uh, we 
also need to perform uh, normalized detection, which we know at the moment. Um, I want to say that Mercury seems like a very good uh, candidate for a room temperature frequency standard uh, with an uncertainty in the 10 to minus 18 level. Uh, but for that, somebody needs to measure the BBR coefficient experimentally, as well as uh, take care of the measurement of the nonlinear lattice light shift, which could be a limitation uh, for the for the Mercury clock. Um, and we would also like to perform more of these uh, frequency ratio measurements, uh, both on the local scale at CERT, as well as, uh, as Rodolphe said, there are some very nice uh, ultra-stable fiber links that are being developed uh, in Europe at the moment. Um, and we would really like to take advantage of this fact to, to measure frequency ratios with the mercury clock below, be, beyond what the SI system of units can do. And finally, we would also like to take part in the comparison with the ACES mission, which should fly uh, next year. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.